Good evening. Glad you're tuning in to our study of Genesis. We're going to be in Genesis chapter 45 tonight. Welcome to everybody else. Glad you're here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We've got some new faces back. Glad to see Charlie and Janice and the Eblings. Glad to see them here tonight. All the way back from the great state of Florida. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 45 this evening. <clears throat> Joseph is going to have the big reveal. And it goes splendidly well. So let's pray uh, and we'll get cranking right into chapter 45 tonight. And God, thank you for this time that you have afforded us. You have blessed us with a nice dry building, a warm building, um, chairs to sit in, tables to lean on, Bibles to read, and just the freedom to think, the freedom to speak out loud, the freedom to have discussion, and the freedom to land in our own spaces based on how you are leading our hearts through your scripture. So thank you for all that. You are so generous and so kind and so true. And we appreciate the opportunity that we get to lean into you tonight, to be in your presence. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts. Give us good listening skills to each other. Help us to speak in a way that is understandable and, and a good tone. Uh, but most importantly, help us to hear your voice tonight. We love you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you'll remember last week... Joseph had challenged his brothers to go home, bring Benjamin back. Simeon stayed back. They come back, and they're getting ready to leave. But Joseph sneaks one of his cups in there into the bags, and when they come back, it just goes awry. And now they're kind of standing in front of him. And Judah is pleading for Benjamin's life, not just for Benjamin's life, but for the sake of dad, Jacob, or Israel. And he's basically telling Joseph that, listen, if we don't take Benjamin back, he's already lost one son, this will do him in. Keep me instead. And so that's where the story left off for us. And so in chapter 45, let's look at the first two verses. It says this, then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard it. And so Joseph again is standing in front of his brothers. He's listening to Judah share his heart about protecting dad and saving his brother. And I can't help but think, um, what Joseph was thinking as he's listening to Judah, who was the very one who said, hey, let's not kill him, but let's at least sell him. Now he sees his brother standing up for his youngest brother, his full brother. And he, could he be thinking like, remember me? Like, why didn't you do that for me? Why didn't you stand up for me? Yeah, you didn't have me killed, but you sold me off. And so maybe, maybe he's wondering that. Maybe he's not. We have no idea really what's going through Joseph's mind. But what we do know is that his emotions get the best of him. This is the second time that we are aware of where he just loses it. The first time was in the previous chapter where he was able to get away, right? And he went into his room away from everybody else, cried his eyes out, cleaned his face up, went right back out and went to dinner with them. This time, he's just, he's done. Like, he's played all the games he can play with them. He's done all that he can uh, to, to basically use his authority the way that he has, and now he realizes it's over. Like, it's time to get dad up here. It's time to reveal myself to the guys. And so he just starts bawling. And can you imagine all his workers, his, his guards, his um, servants, his wise guys that may have been in there, and his brothers all standing there watching the second most powerful man, the governor of Egypt, the one who is in control of all the food, who eats and who dies, just losing it. And they don't have a clue what's going on. They have no idea why this powerfully strong, well-spoken, well-put-together man is now just broken in tears. And he sends everybody out of the room. Everybody's out. 
but my brothers are going to stay. And once he finally gets everybody out, I can only imagine what the workers are doing, right? Maybe they have the glass up against the, the door, right? They want to hear what's going on, but I don't think they need that. Scripture tells us that it is so loud that everybody's hearing what's going on. Now, I do think verses 1 and 2 are kind of like uh, what Moses generally does. He gives you a quick overview of what's going to happen. And then from verse 3 on, he unpacks it. So I don't think Pharaoh heard Joseph crying. I think, I believe that what it's saying here is Pharaoh's going to find out. Because that's not something you can really reveal. And so that's where we end with that. <clears throat> but what are the brothers thinking when he starts to reveal himself? I mean, seriously, could you imagine? I would imagine all the memories are coming back to their head. And I would imagine to some degree they're questioning it. There's no way this guy's Joseph. We sold him into slavery. This is the second most powerful man in the world. Like, there's no way he's Joseph. <clears throat> and yet he finally decides to reveal himself fully to his brothers. So let's read about this revelation. <coughs> Excuse me. Then Joseph said to his brothers in verse three, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? <laughs> so that probably doesn't strike you as funny. That makes me cackle. He drops a massive nuclear bomb on his brothers. I'm Joseph. Well, in their mind, they don't hear anything else. Right? Joseph, like our Joseph, like the Joseph that was annoying, like the Joseph that our dad loves, like the Joseph of the coat of many colors, like the one that we were going to kill, but we sold into slavery. That Joseph? And yet Joseph just simply says, hey, I'm Joseph. How's dad? That Those two don't fit together. But for Joseph, he's been fine this whole time. The only thing he is concerned about is dad. The brothers, on the other hand, their whole world is now flipped upside down. Not only are they discovering that this is their brother that they sold into slavery and is now the most powerful man in the world, or the second most powerful man who could take their lives in an instant, they also got to go back and tell dad. They've got to go back and say, hey, dad, guess what? Now, maybe they don't know that that's going to happen yet. But maybe in the split moment in their mind, they're thinking, what's dad going to say when he finds out what we've done? How are we going to weasel out of this one? So Joseph says, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed in his presence. Again, they're trying to put puzzle pieces together. This isn't possible. Joseph says to his brothers, please come near to me. Now, again, they're not quite sure who this guy is. And the second most powerful man who just lost his emotions looked a little crazy is saying, hey, come near me. So they came near and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you and the earth. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh. And Lord of all his house. And a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So again, these poor brothers are, I'm sure, all over the map of what they're thinking and feeling. One, they're trying to understand this Egyptian saying, I'm your brother Joseph. But not only does he say, I'm your brother Joseph, he throws in a detail that only Joseph would have known. They haven't told anybody. How in the world is this Egyptian going to know that they sold their younger brother into slavery specifically to go to Egypt? Well, Joseph is. And so Joseph says, I know who I am and I know who you are and you need to know now who I am. I'm your brother. I'm the guy that you hated and you sold into slavery. But he doesn't stop there. Now, if it were me, boy, I'd have rode that train for a while. <laughs> right? Uh, we all would have. We would have made them feel so bad. We would have put the best guilt trip on them. We would have made them run through the mud 
and just be miserable for a little while. But look what he says immediately. He says, I'm your brother, Joseph, who you sold into slavery to Egypt. But now do not be grieved or angry. Now, if he had stopped right there, that would have been, we, they would have understand what he was saying. But he says, don't be grieved or angry with yourselves. I love the dig that he puts there. He, he acknowledges and wants them to recognize that, yes, <laughs> you made the decision to sell me into slavery. You made the decision to put this in motion. But he brings it to a space of, please don't get angry with yourself because this was all God's plan. God had this design from the beginning. You were just an instrument in it. This has been probably 20 to 25 years in the making, right? Of him thinking about when I see these boys, what am I going to say? If I ever run into my brothers again, what am I going to do? And now he's had multiple opportunities and he looks at them and he says, hey, I know who I am, but don't beat yourself up. This was all part of God's plan. So in our notes, I got way ahead of myself because this story is just fun to talk about. <clears throat> I, I put some thoughts in there about some questions that we can consider. He says, I'm Joseph House dad. What were the looks on their faces? Like, did they even hear the question of how's that? Are they stuck on who's Joseph? What was going through their minds? How could they possibly respond? How, how can they look at him and give them any kind of response without acknowledging the knuckleheadedness of their lives? What's the second most powerful man going to do to us? I would imagine that was a thought in their head. And then maybe did all the games that Joseph had been playing this whole time, did it finally maybe start making sense to them? My answer to that one is probably no, because I still think they're stuck on Joseph. Like, I'm your brother Joseph. I think they're still working through that. But then he calls him closer, and he begins to explain a little more uh, in detail. Details that only they and he would know. And then he spins it around and says, God allowed this. God did this. God brought me here for a specific reason. And I love that he doesn't just leave it as, yeah, God did this. God brought me here. He goes further to explain why he is confident that God brought him to this specific place to do this specific thing to accomplish a very specific plan that God had enacted. It gives him insight into what is happening. He says, hey, famine has been here for two years. What you don't know is there's five more years coming that it's not going to be easy to plow or good to plow or even any harvest that's coming. It's just going to be bad. And again, he reiterates, the reason that I'm here is because that famine was coming. And God needed to know, he needed to make sure that our family was going to be preserved. And so it was the plan all along. It's a plan of a great deliverance. And so Joseph to his brothers basically says, I don't blame you. Because God's plan is greater than yours. You thought, and we know this later on, you thought this was something bad. The reality is God has flipped it on its head and God has done something great with it. And then he even says, hey, listen, let me tell you about this Pharaoh guy. Now, if you remember when we talked about this Pharaoh before, this is not an Egyptian Pharaoh. He comes from a different nationality and he probably feels somewhat like an outsider like Joseph does. And so they have this kind of camaraderie that's going on. Now, it's an interesting phrase when he says, I'm, God has made me a father to Abraham, or to Abraham, to Pharaoh. Well, it could be that maybe Joseph's older than him. Probably not. The way that I interpret that, the way that I read that is this Pharaoh is coming to Joseph for advice, for direction, for wisdom, just like any son or daughter would go to father, just like we go to God. And so it's an interesting thought. But then he says, not only that, but he has made me Lord over all his household. Everything that he has is mine. And he has made me supreme ruler. It's just an interesting revealing party, right? And again, we, we don't even have the, the real reaction of his brothers yet. They don't know what to say. They don't know what to do. 
I would imagine, Charlie, to some degree, they're mannequin man. Like, no expression. They probably act as if they've seen a ghost. Seriously. Which, technically, yes. In their mind, he's dead. He's light years away. Being a slave somewhere else. Not the most powerful man in the world. Or the second most. So, any any thoughts on those first eight verses? Yes, ma'am. Donna, that's really, really a, a good thought because I agree. I think there was a, a large bit of relief, a relief of, I wonder what always happened to him. I wonder if he's okay. And you're right. The fact of the way that they are defending Benjamin so much and trying to protect dad, I think they've learned a little something to some degree. So, yeah, I think that relief, no matter how small or big it was, filled in with, oh, no. <laughs> right real quick like okay this is done it's kind of like um when you when you've been discovered in a lie and you can finally get that off your chest now the repercussions of that lie come into play and feel that void right but yes there's a sense of freedom of knowing finally we don't have to deal with this anymore yeah we don't have to hide it anymore uh, yes i'm sorry yes and he's never yeah, yeah, that, Mark, that's a great point. I mean, second most powerful man in the world, send a messenger boy, go check on him. Maybe he has, maybe he hasn't, but obviously he hasn't, or else he wouldn't be asking about that, right? It could be that Joseph's been so busy because of the massive harvest that's coming in and having to travel around to all the towns, get everything set up. Maybe, maybe he just... Wasn't thinking about it. Maybe he was trusting God. I don't know. That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Ooh. <laughs> well, then we're going to stop and pray for a quick minute. Uh, if you didn't hear that, uh, it's one of our church members that, or it's a member of the Sunday school class, but he sits really on the end aisle right in front of the um, sound booth. His name's Ray Smallwoods on his way to the emergency room or to the hospital uh, with most likely some internal bleeding. And he's got some kidney issues as it is. So uh, we're going to pause and pray real quick. Father, as hard as it is to know exactly what always to pray for, I am encouraged to know that you are already well aware, that you're already on top of it. And so we come to you as a church family who loves your people, loves our friends, our, our people. And God, our heart breaks for Ray and his wife as they are dealing with a lot of different health issues. God, even just spending the time that I have with them, I know they're tired. So it's very frustrating. But God, this can be a very serious thing. And so as only you can, I ask that the great physician through the power of the Holy Spirit would touch Ray's life, protect him, give him the health that he needs, give the doctors great wisdom in knowing what is going on, where it's happening, and the ability to stop it. Be with his wife. I pray that you would comfort her. Allow her to feel your presence, um, as I'm sure she is stressing. Um, but ultimately, Lord, we trust you in all things. We know that your spirit is powerful. Your hand is powerful. You have the ability to do great and amazing things. In fact, exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. And so we submit this to you. We lay it at your feet, knowing that you hear us, knowing that you care, and knowing that you are able. We just ask that you would. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate that. Any other thoughts on, it's kind of a weird segue, right? I wonder if he ever, like, talked to the brothers or reminded them about the dream. Like, it doesn't say mm. in the Bible how fear started. You know, when he was talking about God's plan, even way back. Yeah, yeah. When he had that dream, that was already way back. God's yeah. Plan and That's interesting. I, I don't know. I, I know, I mean, we know that Joseph remembers as he's put, as the boys, as the brothers are bowing, but. I don't know. And maybe I know there's uh, in just a little bit where he kind of embraces them and talks. I wonder if that's where that kind of starts coming out. It may be that the brothers are like, oh, that's what that meant. Yeah, it could be that they Joseph didn't need to tell him. 
Yeah, I don't know. Yes, ma'am. And then he says, presumably in their mind, and they're sort of thinking, what is happening? Sure. But then the tender moment in verse four, he brings it closer and he says it again. Yeah. So I'm picturing, like, was it in their language then? Now it's definitely in their language. Sure. That tender moment, and, you know, just approaching. <coughs> Yeah, Sarah, it's such a great point because I've often wondered when he's had his interactions with them before, did he speak to them in their native language? Because as an Egyptian, he would have been smart enough, learned enough that he probably would have been able to speak it, is my assumption. Um, but if that's not true, now he is. And that had to be astounding to them. That may be why they were so dismayed, like, whoa, this Egyptian just spoke to us and we understand every word that he's saying. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that, that's that's another fair point, because I know standing this far, my contacts don't work very well distance wise. But when you get close, I can see everything else. And maybe he's a far off they're way over here. And now they're nose to nose. And they're like, oh, this really is Joseph. Yeah, sure. Yes. Bad happens to us. Uh, we have a little, a lot of different kind of emotions. Yes. Rage, uh, revenge, we feel like hurt somebody, hurt us, or something like that. But it's especially bad when a family member do something against uh, a pretty much short. He went through different stages, and I'm assuming, like everybody else, again. That he starts to question about why did he, why they did this to me. But at this point, in the beginning of the chapter, he understood the message of God, what God wants to do. Yeah, Yasha, yeah, that's a great point. And it's something that we're not privy to is how much he worked through this stuff with God. Um, because there are things that I know for me that can happen, and I don't question I can just move through and accept it but then there are other things that take place and I'm like really so does he have those moments I would imagine when he was accused of sleeping with uh, Potiphar's wife gets thrown in jail for no reason seriously God like again like I I would imagine there are moments because I think it's logical for us to have those moments I'm not sure that he stayed in those moments I think he had the conversations I think he just accepted it and because we see that acceptance here. You don't need to be mad. This is not your issue. This is what God has allowed for me. Um, and I think it's it's great for us to get to that place because once we can get there, it really honestly doesn't matter too much what happens after that because we can always circle back around and say, okay, how can God use this? What can we do to experience God's grace in this? Sure. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that really does fit a lot with what Joseph has done for Pharaoh. Yeah. There's a lot of pain that was coming, and he's moved it into this money-making opportunity to save the world, really. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yes, sir. Oh, we did that one last week, Charlie. You should have been here. <laughs> Wait, where's that at? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. To have a brother. Oh. Essentially, saying, I would be a bad 
Mm, that's good. Sure. That's interesting. So it shows the awareness of Joseph of working through all this stuff and recognizing that, yeah, they may have dad, but they don't know what they have. I know what they have. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because he could have said, does our father still live? Yeah, and he's like, nope, nope. And we could look at that and say, man, he's just being rude. No, he's just being truthful. He's being honest. It's where he's at. Yes. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's awesome. Anybody else? That could be. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a really really valid point because we even talked about him waiting there like my brothers are going to have to come at some point because we are the only ones that have grain. But it may not even have been about the fact that they're the only ones that had grain. He knew the dream. He knew they were going to have to come. He knew mom and dad. Well, at least in that dream, it was mom and dad that were going to come. So, yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Two years for sure. Simeon. So yeah. Simeon At least. Yeah. Wouldn't it be funny if it was the same amount of time that Joseph had to stay in prison? What if it was the full two years? That'd be wild, wouldn't it? Yes, ma'am. Well, you raised that so high in prayer. You're a true teacher. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I, I think that's so good. I once heard a, a guy talk about um, how sometimes we rescue people, um, and Joseph's not rescuing them. He's holding them solidly accountable. Yes, you made these decisions. However, as bad as all that is, this is something that God has leveraged that you had no control over. This was out of your hands. But yeah, he holds them accountable, but points it in the right direction of this is really God's doing. Sure. And I, listen, I, I think, I, I don't think, I know in every instance of our lives, we have the opportunity to do that, to leverage everything that takes place for God's glory every single time. It's a matter of, are we willing to do that? Are we willing to look at it in a way that allows God to get glory somehow, some way? Now, in our bad decisions, when we are just completely boneheads, probably not, because sometimes we can be boneheads. But in those moments that are a little out of our control, I think, I know God can use those in a big way. Yes, yes. Yes. Correct. <clears throat> right. Willing. Mm -hmm. because, and, and again, like you say, if it wasn't Joseph, it would have been somebody else. But in this instance, it's Joseph being willing to say, here I am, use me. And he does. Chance? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree. I think so. Yeah, I, I, he's a type of Christ for sure. Yep. Yep. Maybe not the full, but really stinking close because he comes out of nowhere to save the people. And he really is the savior. Oh. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's what he does. And his people doesn't recognize him. It's not about them because this is your plan. I'm following. Yeah, for sure. Anybody else? Again, only underscores why the Old Testament is important. Not sure why I threw that out there, but. All right, let's hit uh, 9 through 13. <clears throat> Hurry, go up to my father. Say to him, thus says your son, Joseph. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. Now, even before I keep going, <laughs> he's sending his brothers who deceived dad back to dad to say, hey, after 20 some years, guess what? Joseph's alive. Hmm. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near to me, you and your children, your children's children, uh, children your flocks and your herds and all that you have there. I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty. For there are still five more years or five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and of all that you have seen. And you shall hurry and bring my father. There it is again, Charlie, down here. So he basically says, go get dad. Get out of here. Go get dad. Tell him when you see him that I am alive. Fill him in on all the details that I'm Lord over Egypt. Get here quick. Don't wait. I want you to live near me and I am going to be the one to take care of you. I'm going to provide everything that you need. If you don't come, just know that you're going to experience great poverty because again, there's five more years of famine that's coming. I know this. It's the reason why we have so much because God has provided for us. You need to be up here so I can take care of you. And then again, he says, look me in my eyes. Look in my mouth. You know me. It is me. Tell dad everything. Hurry up, get home, and get back here quick. Now again, <laughs> I, I still go back to what are these guys thinking? Are they already scheming? Are they already trying to come up with how we're going to figure out how to explain this to dad? Are they figuring out how are we going to escape dad's wrath? Is this going to kill dad to know that we've lied to him, deceived him for all these years? Like there's a lot of scenarios playing through and Joseph doesn't care. He's, I'm not going to torture. Just get here, man. Go get dad. I want to see him. And verses 14 or 15 are so good. It says, then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept on his neck. So the two full brothers, maybe there's a conversation about how's mom, and maybe Benjamin tells him, hey, mom's not alive anymore. Maybe there's some of that. Maybe he already knew that. However, there's that connection between those two boys that is just real and raw. And then, moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Now, here's what's interesting. 14 says, Benjamin and Joseph weep on each other. 15 says, Joseph weeps over the brothers, kisses them, and then they talk. I, I'm telling you, these guys are jammed up, man. They, they don't know what to do. Have you ever been in that spot? Like this dude has every right, every ounce of power to make their lives miserable to death, literally. And he's looking at them and saying, we're good. He's crying as he's hugging and kissing them. That's not normal. We have a hard time doing that to those that mistreat us. And yet we're called to some degree to love our enemies, right? Perfect example of what's happening here. 
What do you think they talked about? Seriously. You would think, right? Just, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> if I had known, I, I, yeah. I wonder how much was that like superficial stuff that started and then it just, it went deeper and deeper and deeper. I wonder if he sat down and just explained to them all, all the ins and outs of everything that he experienced. And just, I can't even imagine like hearing all these things that he experienced as a brother that put him in this spot, even though he claims that God did it, which he did. Like being mortified because they're 20, 30 years older now and a little wiser. Obviously, we see that in the way that they treat um, um, uh, Benjamin. And even we got to get back to get Simeon. Like there's a lot of maturity that's happened. And these aren't young guys. These are older men. And so who knows what they were talking about and thinking about? I would imagine there's a lot of replaying, maybe a lot of catching up. Hey, what did dad do for his 100th birthday? <laughs> I don't know how old he is, right? Like, what did he do this time? What happened? How did mom pass? Where did you bury her? What was her last words? Who, who else is going on? Tell me about your wives. Tell me about your kids. Like, he's telling them, you bring them all here. I will take care of them because I can't. I, I can't imagine what type of conversation was going on. And, and Mark, honestly, as they're apologizing, do they hear anything he's saying? Can they hear anything he's saying? Their mind's already back. We got to tell dad, how are we going to do this? Yeah. Nope, I know. Yeah, that that catches me a little funny. Mm -hmm. So, the nation of Israel really isn't that big. Correct. So, they all come out of the land. So, that's really pretty fun. You know, since they inherited that, they ate their hand. Yep. So, what those people there were, they all had to come out of that land down to Egypt. And it's like maybe they had to come down during everything because they were so small a number. Who knows what other warring? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they really are small because it's Jacob, his wife and two maidservants, their sons, their wives, their kids and the few daughters that he has. So it's not they're not in the millions yet. Like they're still very, very small. So you're right. They don't not a lot of protection there. But Joseph's like, come up here. I got you. We'll take good care of you. Any other thoughts? Family with all that they have without the maximum authority knowing this information. Yeah. So he must be or really believe in God and the other years to him, or um, I don't know if the other guy knows something or knows the story of everything. Or Are you talking about Pharaoh? Pharaoh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and also, Yeah, not, they're not really. Not. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It's uh, a couple of weeks ago we talked about Pharaoh coming from a different nationality, and there's probably some opposition from the Egyptians of having this non-Egyptian ruler leader as an Egyptian ruler leader. And so it's why he's kind of connected to Joseph so well, because he's kind of in the same boat. So, yeah, yeah. Any, any other thoughts? All right, let's keep, oh, yes, ma'am, sure. I'm kind of picturing the brothers maybe being tied. Uh, yeah, yeah, and that, that's truly possible, to be so overwhelmed with emotion that you, there is no emotion, like you can't do anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, 16 through 20. Oh, I am so sorry. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, 
Yes. I, I think they are – I'm pretty confident that they are trying to take it all in and process it on a fly because this isn't normal. Um, they know their hearts, that they have not always been trustworthy. This is an Egyptian, as far as they knew. Are they trustworthy? And now he's saying that he's Joseph. He sounds like Joseph, starting to resemble Joseph. He knows all the details like Joseph. But is this, what is this? Yeah, I, I, I just think about the conversation that they're going to have when they're heading back. All right, 16 through 20. But you're right, they don't have a choice. It's either starve to death or face the music with dad. One of the two. Verse 16, now the report of it was heard in Pharaoh's house saying, Joseph's brothers have come. So it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. Load your animals and depart. Go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat of the fat of the land. Now you are commanded to do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Excuse me. Bring your father and come. Also, do not be concerned about your goods, for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. So Pharaoh hears about this. Now, the question is, did he hear about it during this moment that he's revealing everybody? Did he hear about it later? Did he already know? My guess is he heard about it afterwards because the those that heard about this go and tell him, hey, his brothers are here. Nobody knew that these were Joseph's brothers unless his little steward dude knew it. I don't think he did. I think it's all news to everybody. So Pharaoh hears this and he's like, man, this is great. We've got the best of the best, this Hebrew guy who has just helped us out. Now I get his whole family in town. We are going to rock the house, right? Like if he's smart, I can't imagine what the rest of them are going to be like. And so he's super excited and he goes to him and says, listen, you go home and get everybody and come back. Now, you have to ask yourself, did Joseph make that decision before Pharaoh? Did he know that's what Pharaoh was going to do? Or did it just happen to be that Pharaoh's like, you know what? Just go get him and bring him up, just like Joseph did. Either way, God's plan is he's going to get them all up there. And so he says, move them here. I'm going to give you the best land that we have. That's a nice compliment. It's not a compliment necessarily to his family, but it's a compliment to Joseph. Because if he can trust Joseph, then he can trust them. So you're going to get the best land. Not only the best land, but you're going to get the best food. And then he commands Joseph to tell his brothers to take carts. Could you imagine? No longer just having to walk the entire way or carry or carry donkeys or ride donkeys, right? You can take the carts home. Load your stuff up. Put your kids on it and your wives and roll right back down here to town. This pharaoh is going way outside. And then he says, don't even necessarily worry about getting all your belongings. What we have is yours. We've got the best stuff and you're going to have it. What a start. What a, what a blessing to go from, we're going to starve to death. We have nothing over here in the land of Canaan to the best is yours. Seems very inviting, doesn't it? It's very, very much an entrapment because we know what happens later on. Verse 21 through 28, and then we'll, we'll talk. <clears throat> then the sons of Israel did so. Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh, and he gave them permission, uh, provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garments. But to Benjamin, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garments. Little dig there, probably. This is how you're supposed to treat your younger brother. He sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt and 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for his father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away and they departed. And he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. What that means is don't beat yourselves up and don't play the blame game. Don't look at each other and say, I told you this was going to happen or you shouldn't have done. He's like, let it go. Then, verse 25, they went up out of Egypt, came to the land of Canaan to Jacob, their father. And they told him, saying, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. Jacob's heart stood still. Could you imagine? 
thinking that his son had been torn asunder by wild animals. He may have even kept that coat of many colors drenched in blood hanging up somewhere to where he gets always reminded. And now his sons who obviously the puzzle pieces are being put together, knowing that they deceived him, are hearing this great news and his heart stops, basically. He just freezes. I would imagine the color leaves his face. He doesn't know what to feel, what to say, how to react. He's just numb. Because he didn't believe them. But when they told him all the words which Joseph had said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Then Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. Had to be a little bit of a dagger in the boys' hearts to watch their dad be so excited once again, to know that they caused that. This is their fault. So the brothers do as they're told. They're given the carts and the provisions. Again, Benjamin gets a little extra. Dad gets the 10 donkeys uh, loaded with good, cool stuff, and then 10 female donkeys with the grain and the bread and the food. And Joseph tells him, hurry up. Don't delay and don't argue on the way home. Don't play the blame game. Let it go. Get there. Get your stuff. Get your families. Get here quick because I want to see dad. And then finally, they finally make it home. Again, imagine what that trip was like. I would imagine the blame game started. And they probably constantly had to remind each other, no, Joseph said, don't do this. And now we probably should listen to Joseph. We didn't listen to anybody else ever before. Now's the time we should listen to Joseph. So let's not play that game. But you know as well as I do, there was those little snide comments constantly. Had to be. It's, it's how we're geared. It's what we do. It's how we process. So they make it home. They get to dad, and I'm sure they were rehearsing, hey, how are we going to tell dad? What are we going to say to dad? How are we going to handle his reaction? Because dad's going to lose it. It may kill dad. Like, what are we going to do with this? And so they finally tell him, and dad's reaction is probably worse than what they anticipated. He just doesn't know what to do. Maybe he collapses. Maybe, maybe he does pass out. All we know is he kind of loses life in his figure. As they begin to explain to him because of his disbelief, they begin to tell him everything that Joseph has said, all the things that Joseph has done. And then when Jacob is actually able to see the Egyptian carts, which would have been abnormal. The last time, remember, they just rode in there with their donkeys with the, the sacks of feed over them. Now they have these Egyptian carts that they have drug off and all the stuff with the 20 donkeys that are there. This isn't a normal thing. They didn't have enough money to get all this stuff. So something has to match and work here. And then jo Jacob realizes it and life just becomes reinvigorated for him. And he's like, you know what? He really is alive. And I will not die until I see him face to face. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a cool picture. So, any thoughts on that story? It's a great story. It's a real story, by the way, not a fake one. It's not fake news. It's real. Not fake Bible. It kind of almost says that the perfect thing is called that. And they may have told him that, actually. They may have said, after we talked to Joseph, Pharaoh came in, and he's the one that gave us all this stuff, because Joseph wasn't going to give him all that stuff. That was all Pharaoh's idea. Joseph just said, go get dad, come up here, and I'll take care of you. Pharaoh's like, no, do more than that. Help them out. Send some U-Hauls with them. Like, make it easy. Sure. They could have easily lied. Yeah. Yeah. Because they are capable of going to extremes. And they, they could have easily said, hey, you know what, Dad, we found this really nice piece of land. 
the the ruler said we could have it. Like they they didn't have to say all those things, but with all these gifts, you you can't help but say what the truth is. Yeah, it's good. That's true. That is true. They they can put themselves in their dad's place of feeling what he would have felt in losing a child. And I that'll make you grow up real fast. So yeah, I think that helped in their maturing process to realize, ooh, that's what that would have felt like. Yeah. Yes, sir. I don't see them like beginning with the Nope. And Yeah, because their dad knows something was up here. But you know what's interesting is they really didn't say anything about the story. They let dad make the story up. They just ran with it. Hmm. Mm -mm. No. Oh, are you talking about the brothers or dad? The brothers had said, okay, this is God's punishment towards us, but I don't think dad has said anything. So, no, I know what you're talking about because he didn't want to send Benjamin because he's like, what, what happens if he dies and then I'm going to die now that my last son, but like my first son died, now this one's dead. Is that what you're referring to? Okay. Yeah. Mm. You, yes, ma'am. I think of how blessed we are that we have the fear of God because how many like that that you can work in? Yes. Just this one story. And yeah. They didn't have one. Yes. Yeah. Jan, it's such a great, great point because we can look at this story and say, wow, we can see God working. It gives us a an outline to look at our own life and try to pick out where God is at work. They didn't have that. Joseph's trying to figure this craziness out. My brothers are killing me, throwing me in a pit, selling me off, working for Potiphar, accused of nothing, thrown in jail, down here rotten, and now I'm the second most powerful man in the world. Only God can do that. And so, yeah, yeah, we have a perfect framework to, to but do we do that? No, not all the time. We don't. So if you were going to a situation where you're being accused of something, you didn't do anything, you miss it. You know, you get to see. There is a happy ending. Yeah. And it gives you hope to just keep plugging along. Yes. One day at a time, one day at a time. I mean, there's all of these kinds of great stuff that you have. But you just go to one day at a time, one day at a time, and then you see this happy ending. And I guess it doesn't always be a happy ending, but God's going to be with you every step of the way. Sound like you know something about that. <laughs> <Not bad. laughs> one day at a time. That's it. One breath at a time. A lot of times. Yes, sir. Yeah. I just want to see my boy. Yeah. Just get me there. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, but the and and that's such a great point. But the determination is, I'm going to go there. I'm going to make it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So it's such a great story. And then we haven't talked about this, but what do you think J Jacob thought? Like, how? Have you ever experienced where you thought all hope was lost and then just have that new fresh, like, ah, it's there. Yeah, there, there's something great about that. And I, I just see that happening with Jacob. And, and it's not fully there yet because he hadn't seen his boy yet. 
but there's hope. And hope usually is enough to get us through to where we see it. In fact, hope is the only thing right now that we have to get us to the very end. Hope in Christ is all we have. And that's all we need. Any other thoughts? <laughs> yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, George. I think I put the ball around you like yes, what what the lie. Yeah. Yeah. Once I see him, then I'm coming to you guys. Yeah. 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 Let me talk to my second most powerful son in the world. <laughs> let me let me give him some advice. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Anybody else? All right, we'll hit uh forty six. Uh, and potentially 47 next week. Uh, and then we're almost done with Genesis. And then we're going we're gonna to roll right into Exodus, just so you know. I'm trying to get to um, Chronicles as quick as we can to spend weeks and weeks on the big ats. <laughs> All right, let me pray for you. God, you're good. Thanks for uh, just um, the camaraderie that's here, uh, the freedom that's here again, as I said before. God, it was all because of you. Um, it is fun to look back and see where you are and have been and continue to be at work. And I am just thankful for the privilege that we all have, that I have just to be included in your work. And so thank you for that opportunity. Help us to be careful that we don't squander it. Help us to be mindful of it all and to leverage it the best that we can. We love you, praise you, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> Have a good night. Sorry about forgotten.